underway. Thank you once again for joining. My name is Wade Crofin and I lead the Natural Resources Agency here in California. Many of you who are joining may be employees across our 20,000 person agency, or uh, you could be a community partner uh, doing uh, work and shared priorities, uh, or really a, a policymaker. This speaker series is all about bringing big ideas and leaders from across California and beyond to uplift shared priorities. And it's why I'm so excited to be holding this discussion with a set of great leaders. Um, as you know, this conversation over the next hour will be a deep dive where we'll learn uh, from Black and African-American practitioners in environmental stewardship on the actions that people are taking now for a future and the perspectives uh, they bring to the work as leaders and as African-Americans. And so I'm glad that this is sort of the culminating event of what has been a really dynamic month in celebration of black history. And I wanna just name some of the things that have happened over the last month and, and thank uh, those who have put these various events together. Uh, in, on Friday, February 3rd, we held a, a, an event called Career Pathways for Blacks and African-Americans in State Service all focused on how we can recruit and retain African-American leaders, not only in the resources agency, but across the state. Um, we celebrated Black History Month at Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park, which is in Tulare County, and tells the story of the only California community founded, built, governed, and populated uh, uh, entirely by African-Americans. Remarkable place, and, and held a celebration there on Saturday, February 11th. A little bit later in the month, uh, our partners at CAM, the California African American Museum, held a Black History Month Prosperity Market, which was an incredible event that our colleague, hopefully Cameron, will talk about. And then, of course, we're holding this discussion here today. Uh, also outside of our building here in Sacramento at our headquarters, we commissioned a piece of artwork, a living artwork, uh, chalk art, um, that commemorates uh, uh, a range of African-American conservation leaders, including the pioneer surfer, Nick Galbadon, uh, the American park ranger, the iconic Betty Reed Soskin, uh, the environmental, environmentalist and planet walker, John Francis, and more. So it has been a really dynamic month and I'm so excited to be with you all in conversation. I have the honor of introducing who we'll be talking to today and I'll start off by introducing my co-moderator in this effort, who is Jared Patton. Jared, give a wave. Jared is a colleague and friend and a deputy director at the California Conservation Corps. He's a deputy director in Northern California. So he leads all of the Conservation Corps work in this part of the state. You may know that the California Conservation Corps year in and year out has about 1,300 young Californians that are doing conservation work and exploring careers in conservation. And Jared has been an incredible leader in so many respects, not only in the Conservation Corps, but across our agency. And Jared, you've been really central to everything we've done this month, so much appreciated. We're joined by Don Murphy. Uh, and I love everything about Don, except for his baseball cap as a Northern Californian. <laughs> Um, Don uh, served as director of California State Parks for, for six years, from 1992 to 1998. He went on to serve as deputy director of the National Park Service from 2001 to 2007. He retired as CEO and president of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in 2012. Uh, and he brings a remarkable set of experiences to the conversation. I'll also plug his current podcast called Life is a Story We Tell Ourselves. And I know about this podcast because I uh, had the honor of joining him as a guest. Uh, Tina Ter Terrell is a uh, giveaway of Tina. Tina is a leader at the U.S. Forest Service, where she has had a 40-year career um, leading on in numerous respects. And we caught up and she explained to me that she served in and supported every national 
forest in California, of which there are almost 20, and done work across the country. Now she is the Senior Executive for National Recruitment in the Forest Service. And her, her resume is incredibly impressive. Number of leadership stints uh, across the federal government, including helping to lead uh, the Job Corps Civilian Conservation Centers. And really passionate about educating young people, honorary mem member fellow of the Society of Amer American Foresters and a legend awardee of the National Society for Minorities in Agriculture, Natural Resources and Related Sciences. Tina, thank you so much for all of your leadership and being here today. Cameron Shaw is a colleague and a friend who leads the California African American Museum. She is a curator, writer and editor. I think she came to the California African American Museum from being a founding editor and leader of a contemporary arts nonprofit organization. And she has done incredible things at the African American Museum, which is located in Los Angeles at our exposition park and excited for her to talk about the work that Pam, the museum is leading in partnership with our state parks uh, to improve the stories we tell. Bill Vandenberg, give a wave. Many people know you, Bill, uh, but for those who don't, he comes with uh, a career of experience expo exposing black and brown youth to natural areas in Southern California and beyond, from Baldwin Hills to Yosemite. He has been an Inglewood Scout troop leader, hiking crew founder, Crenshaw High teacher, serving as a role model for stewardship across Los Angeles. Also an avid volunteer and vice chair of the Sierra Club Santa Monica Mountains Task Force, he currently serves on the governing board of the Baldwin Hills Regional Conservation Authority. And then Derek, welcome. Derek Steele joins us as uh, last but not least uh, joint into this conversation. And he serves as the executive director of the Social Justice and Learning Institute or SGLI, working to solve inequities and inequalities that plague communities of color in the African-American community. Uh, and he came to this role leading the Social Justice Learning Institute uh, from a, a role as health equity programs director. Under his leadership, his team taught over 15,000 families, nutrition, physical activity, urban agriculture, and they're doing incredible work across Los Angeles. So once again, thank you for all the work you all do and for joining this really first ever conversation of this kind. Jared, many thanks to, for co-moderating this discussion, and I'm gonna turn it over to you to get our discussion started today. Perfect, thank you, Secretary, uh, much appreciated. I'm starting to get chills and listening to the stories and the histories and the biographies of all these heavy hitters that we have on this panel today. And thank you again for, for joining us. Secretary, thank you again for the use of this platform to amplify these voices, tell these stories, share this space, uh, and share out this wisdom that I know that all these folks are going to impart on the 247 participants and counting. That is really great to see. Uh, thank you to my esteemed and brilliant panel for joining us today and sharing your time and your talent with us. And audience, thank you for tuning in during the lunch hour. Uh, there will be an opportunity for you to ask your questions. Go ahead and throw those in the chat for the panelists. Uh, and I really appreciate the accessibility of being able to meet all online like this. That means we can uh, access people far and wide. And finally, thank you to the committee that helped plan all the Black History Month events under the umbrella of CNRA. It was Black-led and ally-supported. We haven't seen anything like this before. And it was a great first start. Uh, we're going to jump into the conversation quickly because time is of the essence. The big question in front of us today, panel, is this. How can we generate, activate, and promote more opportunities for Black-led environmental stewardship? There are many challenges in front of us, and so attempt to answer this question. We need to use all of your brain power experience and wisdom from across all the disciplines here in education, youth development, policy advocacy, local, state, federal perspectives, urban farming, outdoor recreation, forest service, park service, art, and storytelling. And to begin the conversation, Don, I wanna begin with you. Uh, Stewardship is about a relationship and connection. So beginning with you, Don, share a little bit about your connection to the natural world and how you define stewardship. 
Well, sure. I'm glad to use the word connections and relationship because we as human beings are all connected to the earth and connected to the environment. It's where we sprang from. Even in a biblical and spiritual sense, uh, the environment and the earth is where human beings sprang from. So we have a fundamental connection uh, to the environment. And I believe very strongly uh, that in answer to your question, the fundamental question you were asking about, you know, how do we encourage more people, more people of color, Black and African Americans uh, to become involved and in my way of thinking, all people to become involved. Uh, it starts with the family. And I have a real brief family story to tell. I mean, my family uh, was very connected to the environment. My first and oldest photograph that I remember is my family standing on the rim of the Grand Canyon uh, as we migrated from uh, the South, from Louisiana. And my mother read Sunset Magazine uh, religiously. And wherever Sunset Magazine said to go, that's where we went. Uh, without any trepidation or, or fear or concern about discrimination or anything. My mother uh, was absolutely fearless. And so we went everywhere in the environment. So it began with the begins with the family. So we can share uh, with our family members um, our passion and our uh, concern uh, for the for the environment. Uh, and so it begins there, even uh, 30 or 40 years ago, when we had a fam camp program in California state parks, we found that um, going to rec centers involving families uh, to begin with, not just the kids, but recruiting mm -hmm. entire families and having many conversations uh, with families to uh, dispel fears that people had about going into the environment uh, and setting up the means uh, for them to then have that experience. Uh, we had uh, partnerships with Coleman uh, Company, Camping Company, for example, and many other companies that provided free camping equipment. So those are just some of the uh, the small things that, that can be done and have been done um, in the past. And I know many people uh, continue to do uh, as well. Great. Thank you. It begins with the family for Don. Tina, what about you? Where did it begin for you? Thank you, Jared. So I'm going to continue with Don as the family uh, so my connection to nature and stewardship started with my mother and my aunt when I was 10 years old. Uh, I was born and raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, so the big city. And uh, to me, I look at stewardship and connection to nature is where each one of us is. Uh, I've been with the Forest Service as uh, the Secretary of State for 40 years. I've worked literally on every speck of California, but I say people in Southern California don't have to go to Northern California to see nature. Uh, as a matter of fact, people in Southern California don't have to go up to Big Bear. It's right in your backyard. I lived in Southern California in San Diego. So the connection starts with the family, but it continues with someone taking a young person up a mountain or taking them to a river or to a creek or yeah, to the ocean to see those big, beautiful animals. Yes, everyone, for those who don't know, you can see the whales <laughs> in the ocean. So that to me is that connection because I did not have that until my mother took me to see nature. And I fell in love with nature in an urban area. Uh, so that to me, the stewardship I would like to say is starting with someone to take someone out there, whether they're young or old. I would say I took my cousins to Alaska last year. My cousins are my age. It was the first time they were in Alaska and they fell in love, that big, beautiful state. Mm -hmm. They've never been there. So that's the connection. But I will end with connection is where we connect people to the green and the gray. And the reason I say the gray is because it's great to be in the green infrastructure, wherever it is, whether it's a park or a forest. But we also need to realize some people need to connect where they actually need a road to get there or a trail or a bridge, whether they're young or they're older. And that's what we're striving to do is to connect people to nature where they are. I that's love to be that. the stewards of tomorrow. All right. Green and the gray. I love that. Mm -hmm. Derek, uh, what about for you? What's your story? Man, so I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, and my first introduction to uh, this part of my life uh, started with going to Camp Allegheny. <laughs> uh, being being outdoors and seeing this is the first time I picked up a bow and arrow. Uh, it, it was the the first space that I that I ever jumped into a lake, uh, you know, to really get the get the vibes. And mm -hmm. I've carried that energy in every other space that I've been to, whether it is the reservoirs. And and some of the green spaces in uh in, in the area surrounding Baltimore, Maryland, 
uh, to all the different activities and opportunities here in California since my family and I have moved out here. Um, but even even still in this space, I, I want to tag on to what Tina was saying. You know, uh, there are all these uh, magnificent places for you to be able to do that throughout the different county parks and state parks. Uh, uh, but that green space that actually is in your local park, your pocket park, right? Uh, you know, at the Social Justice Learning Institute, um, we built 126 uh, community gardens uh, yes. in, in the community, right? Uh, getting the young folk as well as families in touch with uh, uh, how to actually grow the food that you could take access to uh, right around the corner from your house or even in your backyard or even on the patio that you may have, even if you may not, uh, you know, have a, a house with green space on it, you know, you can create that space within your own facilities too. Um, so it, it really, in, in your own structures, in your own space, and even with your own community, you can actually elevate uh, your, your touches and ground yourself. Uh, which opens up the door for so many other things. You know, uh, the young people who have been a part of our programming and gardening at the schools, um, we've had we've had partnership with uh, uh, the water departments uh, to do water tours uh, throughout the community to be able to see other green spaces and how the the work around parks around uh, the work around water, how those things have come together uh, in our urban area. Uh, you can see these things that you may just drive past every single day, but when you take a moment to kind of sniff the roses no pun intended, uh, you, you actually can see that the livelihood, the life that's actually around you is, is just as beautiful as some of the places that are even beyond, uh, that you may not be able to reach every single time, but it's a starting place to get you to those places. I love that. And thank you both for naming and highlighting the urban and the rural. So the urban equally important in this conversation. Um, let's see, Cameron, what about you? What was, what's, what's been your entry point into this world? Yeah, so I grew up in urban Los Angeles. And I was a very imaginative child. So I remember imagining landscapes like rolling fields and forests long before I ever got the chance to experience them myself. Um, so when I finally did get that opportunity, I was filled with such awe and a deep sense of peace. And I feel like that's the thing that I continue to carry with me today. I'm grateful for that that ability to continually reconnect to that sense of peace. Mm -hmm. And that can come through travel beyond the city. But again, like folks mentioned, those moments of connection that exist in many of our backyards, whether that's the urban park or green space. Um, so thinking about stewardship, um, to me, it means learning not only how to care for the natural world in our lifetime, but about building healthy relationships to sustain us for generations to come and especially teaching young people about what it means to access those places, whether that's first in their mind or in their reality, but how important it is to care for this natural world that we've been gifted. Um, and to be clear, you know, I'm, I'm not an environmental steward professionally. I'm a, a cultural steward working in the museum field, but I think of it in similar ways, you know, cultural objects and experiences, they connect us to the past, they reflect our present, but they also really have the ability to transform how we see the world for the betterment of future generations. I love that. Thank you for, for bringing that into the space as well, that the cultural piece. Uh, and you're right, sometimes we might plant a tree that we might not be able to sit under its shade. And that's what stewardship is about. It is about uh, leaving something behind for the next folks. Bill, what about you? You've been doing this a long time. I have. I Can you hear me yet? I can hear you great. Great. Um, I grew up as a, as a Boy Scout on the East Coast in a very urban area. Um, hikes for us were basically city walks um, with very little exposure to, you know, to the trees and the woods and the forest and all that stuff. Um, when I came to California, what, 45 years ago and had two sons, I wanted them to have nature experiences. So I, you know, I became a scout leader here for them. And as my, my, my kids grew older and transitioned from Cub Scouts to Boy Scouts, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the boys at that age, 13, 14, they would drop out. At the same time, I became um, a teacher at Crenshaw and then the Dean of Discipline at Crenshaw. And I started this Eagle Club program and I started inviting my students to come on hikes with my Boy Scouts on the weekends, um, especially girls. And the first time one girl came, 
And the next hike a month later, four girls came. And before I knew it, I had more girls coming on these hikes than, than boys. So I transitioned from my Boy Scout troop to the equal club I created at Crenshaw High School. And I received very, very generous support from the Sierra Club, the National Sierra Club, not the local chapter. And that allowed me to greatly expand the program. It funded trips to um, a two week trip to the Teton Science School um, for my kids, um, a week long total immersion program in Yosemite National Park. And um, that's what really got things, things going. Why I did it personally, I was just trying to do the things I didn't really have the opportunity to do as a kid myself. But once I saw the benefit it was giving to my, my students, um, I really got, got involved in it. And I've been doing that ever since. Phenomenal, thank you, thank you. Um, so some of the things I've been hearing from all of you, family, it's really important to have those early influences uh, it is, you know, we stretch the circle wider to make sure that we're including the natural and the cultural and all of the stewardship can take place both in the, the urban and the rural. A little bit of the definition and setting there, but, but why? Why is it important for Black and African Americans to become and be protectors of the environment, of our natural spaces, of our cultural resources? What is the, why is that important for us folks? Uh, Don, I'll begin with you again. Well, I, I mean, I, I take it from a, you know, global uh, point of view um, in answering the, the question. I think every sentient human being um, is responsible for uh, the care uh, and stewardship of their natural in environment. Um, for Black uh, African Americans, um, it may be doubly important only in the, the context of the very important uh, need to get um, everyone to understand why as a human being, it's, it's important um, to not feel um, excluded and to feel that sense of connection and to not allow um, what I would call misplaced in, uh, societal wrong, uh, norms, whether they're in the form of, um, of racism, uh, unintended consequences of discrimination. It's important that um, everyone feel that uh, connection. I think the, the great travesty is not so much uh, young people not being to access the in, environment mm -hmm. um, as it is the uh, disconnection um, that they may be made to feel because that connection is fundamental to uh, to us as a human being. And then um, I think the cultivation of that is, uh, is extremely um, important. So the why in answering um, that question is that um, how can you be a uh, complete uh, human being unless you feel that connection uh, and that sense of responsibility in order to contribute to the, to the well-being of society uh, as a whole. And I want to see everybody uh, from all walks of life, from all cultural backgrounds, from all ethnic backgrounds, uh, accepting that, uh, that responsibility and that sense of stewardship. So for me, that's the, that's the why uh, in answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I saw a lot of head nods too, sort of talking about the, the disconnect that folks experience. Uh, does anyone else want to, to jump on that question, why it is important for folks to show up? Yeah. I'm a, Let's go uh, Bill first, then Tina. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a pragmatist. Um, you know, I'm outdoors. I've been in the last 15 years to 44 different national parks, not monuments, but national parks. I could count on two hands the number of African-Americans I've encountered in my travels. Um, I worked this past summer as an interpretive ranger at, at Mono Lake, um, just outside of Yosemite National Park in the eastern Sierras. We would, we would service two, 300 visitors a day. All summer, um, I saw three African-American families. And the issue for me is 
at some point we will be, people of color will be the majority in this country. And, you know, in order to protect these open spaces in these beautiful parklands, we're going to be called upon to, to fund bonds, to pay taxes. And if we don't have an investment, if we don't know these places um, from personal experience, why, why will people do it? Um, so that's my, that's my whole pitch. I want kids to learn, to grow up, have families, and, 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 to, and to know these places for themselves and to be able to support them in the future so that they're there for their grandchildren. Yeah. Thanks for speaking about that. I know that uh, Blacks and African Americans more or less make about 13% of the U.S. population, but less than 1% of the uh, visitors to the national forest system. So there is a disconnect there. Tina. Thank you, Jared. So yeah, I continue with that disconnect. Um, and I would, I'll phrase another piece of words. I say every human being in particular, all that are people of color, is that they are the citizen stewards of tomorrow which take care of the land now for future generations. Um, that is hard for the Forest Service in many respects because many of our national forests are in rural areas. And so people live in the city, 85% of the American population. That's why I say it's connecting people to nature where they are, but it's also informing people of where other areas of nature are. Um, that takes a lot more of discussing with people that there's places that's outside California, again, Grand Canyon uh, in Arizona and helping people once they go there, that they are inclusive. That's what Bill's talking about. That is not just, oh, okay, you're up there. I go back to the story of my cousins when we went up to Alaska. We sat in the airport as we took a plane to the train. I will say, those who've never done it, take the plane, which is a float plane to Skagway, Alaska. We did that. And we sat in the airport with about five or six other people. And we got into a conversation because they said, yeah, we don't see many people of color up here, black people. We need to have more conversations to make people feel comfortable. And we were comfortable in that conversation, which is how do you help open the doors of nature to all? That takes us who are dealing with nature, which is managing it, but also takes each one of you out there to say, let me go to that particular area that I heard about. And yeah, let me find and say, how do we get others to see it? Because once they see it, they will love it. And it doesn't mean they got to live up there. They will know it's part of their heritage. And that's the thing that I want to flag is this idea that it is our heritage. It's our birthright. It's our inheritance as much as it is for anyone else in this country. And that our ancestors had deep connection with the land. And many of us have been systematically alienated from those connections as an expression of racism and oppression. So this is a reclamation, right? For hundreds of years in this country and long before that, as part of our indigenous African traditions, we were protectors of this land and stewards. We were farmers, we were herbalists, we were healers. Many of us still carry on these traditions today, but we have to remind folks who feel that sense of alienation that this is our cultural and uh, natural inheritance as well. Right, a birthright. Only only last piece that I would add to that is we we uh, have always historically been the storytellers uh, as well, right? And so to make sure that there is the continuity and the continuation and this continuum of uh, uh, stewardship that all of my counterparts here have also talked about, um, we want to make sure that we're carrying those stories into the future. Um, you know, uh, every every tree that falls has a story to tell. Every uh, landscape that is there has has a history to it. Um, how we got there, how we discovered it, um, uh, what what has happened to us since then, and where 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 it can be in the future. To the point of what Bill was talking about, um, and, and as far as our responsibility to these things, we want to be able to carry those stories with us as well, as a part of the culture. Thank you. Uh, what I love about this panel, we've got folks from all, all of, multiple generations are represented here. You're all in different stages in your career, in your life's work. Uh, reflect on some of the challenges you've witnessed. You started to name some of those and some of the experiences you've had, either retelling our stories, reclaiming our stories, showing up Black in natural spaces. Uh, but as a practitioner in this particular space, uh, what wisdom can you share about some of the challenges that you have encountered in your storied careers? Don, we'll begin with you. You got a thought there. Well, I, I mean, I have a, 
it's a long story and and it really begins um unfortunately with how um exclusive resources agencies uh have been historically uh when it comes to hiring practices uh particularly people of color and and women i had an extraordinarily difficult time um getting on as a California State Park Ranger uh, in, in my career. And at the time that I did apply for um, the position as a State Park Ranger in, in California, uh, the California Resources Agency was under court sanction uh, for its hiring practices and could not hire people unless uh, they went through a particular um, process with the, uh, with the personnel office. And uh, when I attempted to get a job, just to be very blunt and practical about it, I went to the state personnel office and uh, was told that there was no such position as a California State Park Ranger. And I was a PhD candidate and they told me, well, maybe the best thing for you to do is uh, try to be a laborer with the Department of Fish and Game. Um, and uh, I went to several parks. I was at the University of California at San Diego working at the Salk Institute at the time. I went to Torrey Pines um, State Park, asked the ranger uh, there, how do you get on to be a California State Park ranger? And he just basically dismissed me and said he didn't know and, you know, go to the state personnel office, which I'd already done. Uh, went to a beach on uh, in Orange County where I finally ended up working, uh, ironically, asked a ranger there. Um, he just flat out said he, he couldn't tell me. Uh, ironically, that same, he, he was actually a park aide at the time, and that same guy uh, became my roommate when I went to the uh, ranger academy. Um, I, I bring up the, the story. It's really worse than that. Um, back then, you could not even... Um, hardly apply for the job. They had a one day or two or a three day window that you could actually apply to take the exam to become a state park ranger. If you missed that two or three day window, you were just flat out of luck. And so I found out about this and I called the state personnel uh, office at um, the resources agency. This is a true story. Every single day for a month, asking them when um, are they going to give the test to be a ranger? And every call, she said, well, pretty soon. I don't know. It's, it's going to happen soon. In the meantime, solely by chance, I saw an announcement for an intermittent ranger, which is a part-time ranger. Uh, and um, I said, well, I'll just take that test and maybe I can get on part-time. I'll, I'll bring this to conclusion quickly. Went to that interview, did a great job. and. At the end of the interview, the guy said to me, oh, you would have made a great permanent uh, ranger. Too bad you missed the test we gave last week. Now, this is me calling the state personnel board every single day for a month. I finally had to threaten to sue the resources agency um, to get to take the test to become um, a ranger. And um, and even after I took the test, got on a list, and this is an un unattended, unintended consequence, but it shows you how bureaucracy and systemic racism works. And I want people to hear this. So they had decided, the state personnel board had decided to, the way to rectify the situation was to have two split classes. Um, you could become a ranger by having a four-year degree and a one-year probation, or you could become a ranger and get on another list by um, having two years of college and two years of probation. So guess who knew about this second list and populated the second list? all of the people who were already knowledgeable about the way you got to become a state park ranger. So there were hardly no African-Americans or women 
or people of color on either list because the people that knew about it um, took the tests and that's how it got, uh, got populated. And this is how in um, terrible um, the system, systemic racism was. And I, and I bring it up to say that, so a young person back then, and this was in, in the eighties, wanting to become a ranger, wanting to get it on as a job, as a, um, in the resources agency, would have been tremendously discouraged um, and felt even more excluded um, as a result of this, even though there was this desire to, to start to recruiting more people. That's why it's important for people like us to communicate with the broader community, uh, with our families, with people that we know, with the connections that, that we have uh, in encouraging them and also telling them the intricacies of how these organizations work so that they don't get, get discouraged. And I'll have to stop. I don't. I didn't mean to take up that much time, but um, I felt I needed to tell the, the whole story. Thank you. Thank you for telling that story. That is that's part of the history. I saw a lot of knowing, uh, knowing head nods about your experience, a mix of surprised and unsurprised at the same time. And that that system, that bureaucratic system, is designed to work perfectly as it is, and knew exactly what it was doing. Thanks for sharing that, Don. Sure. Uh, now, uh, Tina, when Don mentioned the word discouragement, I saw a bit of a, a head nod for you. Anything you want to touch on or bring up? Sure, thanks. So I'll, I'll tackle on the last question about, as a professional practitioner, I am a process navigator. And that's what Don is talking about, because it's mm -hmm. one thing to talk and communicate. It's the system barriers that are in almost everything we do. Mm -hmm. And some people say it's for discrimination. I will agree. It's also a brand of, we like to talk amongst the people we know. I, I, I'm a forester. I don't mind saying that. I'm a forester. And I would hang out my, my forestry friends, which are mostly Caucasian males. I don't mind saying that because they're the reasons why I am in the agency I am. Mm -hmm. But also say, because I do that, I also have to hang out with others because they know the systems. That's why I hang out with them. And mm -hmm. then we discuss with others how to maneuver in the systems. That's extremely important because the systems are there for a reason. We need a bureaucratic system to manage. What we don't need are the biases that Don is bringing in that comes into, oh, only those who are here can know how to play over here. And that's my job as a process navigator is to remove those barriers. Mm -hmm. So anyone can manipulate and not manipulate wrong is manipulate how to maneuver through the system. Mm -hmm. That is how I find success. Mm -hmm. Love that. Navigation, navigator, Derek, are you? So, so from a from a navigation standpoint, I, I'll, I'll be honest. I I bring that context to the local space, right? Mm -hmm. um, because uh, in our urban spaces, uh, growth looks different. You know, when we were talking about growing food and, and making sure people have access, uh, many times the decision makers are talking about uh, growing economies and. Uh, uh, trying to trying to be bring different dynamics to our spaces for that for that level of growth, um, and the things that are necessary and needed by the people and who live in these spaces uh, kind of go to the wayside. You know, in a, in a space like Inglewood, California, where sixty three percent of the people who live there are renters um, uh, who don't have uh, the high levels of access uh, to green space. Uh, not because there aren't green spaces available, but mainly because they don't have the time to partake into it. Um, the the conversations on how we engage them look different, right? Uh, and um, so when we start to bring these avenues to the table, and you know, for us, it was our young folks. Our young folks saw uh, that there wasn't access to healthy food in their areas. There was more fast food restaurants, liquor stores, convenience stores, and, and near their school, uh, they wanted to create a different space of uh, uh, not only not only access to healthy food, but also mindful activities uh, that was near their school, that was adjacent to some of the um, after school programming that may have been available to them by way of sports or whatever. Um, they wanted something different. And so they advocated for it. They went to city council. They went to the school board. Uh, they created presentations to talk about the dynamics and the differences and the, and the, and the necessities for these things. Um, 
And after some initial uh, pushback, but because of the, uh, the the not giving up spirit that these young folk had, you know, that's that uh, empty vacant lot that was across the street from their school turned into a uh, an oasis of of food being grown, uh, staging so that they could have community events. Um, you know, uh, even creating, even using that space with uh, solar panel cisterns, the whole nine to be able to have pump water being pumped uh, uh, by way of uh, uh, things that were happening in that space. But that opened up the door for a larger movement for the for the area around us about how we can steward and how we can get people activated uh, in these spaces. But the voices have to be heard to move and change the mindsets of the decision makers because they see the world differently than we do. Right. They see the needs differently than we do. And uh, it, it's going to come with the voices of those who are usually less empowered to be empowered uh, to be able to create the change they want to see. I want to piggyback on that because I think there's something really critical um, in what was just said, which is encouraging young people to be advocates and navigate systems is also about teaching them how to tune into their own individual compass through listening. So I feel like I'm at the very beginning of what I hope is a long journey at the California African American Museum. But I recognize that the knowledge, skills, and experience I acquired along the way led me to this point. And I, it, I just came from listening to myself and having adults in the room, elders around me, and peers who said, hey, yeah, listen to yourself, check in with yourself, um, because that defined what I wanted to learn next and what I wanted to learn next helped me seek out new jobs or opportunities or to make my own. So, you know, now that I'm, I'm 40, I feel this deep sense of purpose in my work because I listened to myself and I checked in with myself along my professional path. And I had folks who encouraged me to do that. So for me, the wisdom is that it's so much easier to face the everyday challenges and setbacks when you feel a deep sense of purpose in your work. And finding that inner compass is what leads you to that sense of purpose that can guide you along the way. Beautiful. I don't know if you can't see, but there are just tons of love and emojis for all the things you've all shared today. This one's too distracting for you. Bill, any last words on this one? Yeah, I just want to circle back to what Don and both Tina touched on. You know, in this program I had at Crenshaw High School, I had a student, 10th grade, I took him to Yosemite for the first time, first time he saw snow. Um, he participated in a week-long backcountry immersion program. He came back his senior year of high school to do a two-week job shadowing program at MPS. Then he got um, a position as an intern at Wawona as a backcountry ranger. He then went on to work for two seasons at um, Teton National Park building trails. This kid wanted to be, he wanted to work for national parks. He graduated college, biology and, and, and computers, double major, bilingual, um, um, Spanish and English, and just the nicest kid. I mean, his personality was just wonderful. He couldn't get into MPS and he just got frustrated. And is, you know, he's now with his father doing some real estate stuff, but that's not what his dream was. Um, the MPS um, has so many barriers, you know, and it's so much nepotism and you have to be able to work unpaid for maybe years. I have a good friend. I take my, my kids, my former students at Crenshaw, uh, for the last seven years, we volunteer with the Yosemite Volunteer and Park Program. We go out and do habitat restoration every, every summer. Um, and the, our coordinator, She's been a seasonal non-perm employee like forever because she can't get a position. Now she's white, <laughs> she can get a position. Um, so it's just it's just so frustrating. Um, I was so glad to get the opportunity to work for the Forest Service, Tina. Now I, I found out that I was hired under as an AD under the COVID national emergency. And I may not be able to go back because I didn't go through USA jobs which in itself is a nightmare, that application for USA Jobs. You have to watch like five videos to figure out how to do the application. And if you don't do it just right, you don't get past the computer screening that's involved because the computer decides if your application gets 
pushed over to a, a human to actually review. Um, mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's that's what's so frustrating. So, but to and, and I guess folk. And so I wanted to answer that to that to that point uh, to what Bill saying, what Don saying, what Tina's saying. You know, uh, this idea of advocacy and us uh, really getting engaged in stewardship. Um, I think there's one aspect of stewardship of the land, but stewardship of the process. Like, what what is it that we can bring to the table? What energy can we be behind to for the for the uh, for for the ceilings that you've already crashed open and 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 continue to keep bumping up against to support the process of that? Right. I, I think that that is the other part of stewardship that we want to get to, so we can open up the doors for people who are interested to follow behind and to be a part of the stewardship as far as the land is concerned as well. You know, that, that I think that's really critical of learning the lessons that you all have uh, have learned and being able to create processes and also advocacy behind changing the process. There's no reason why you should have to watch five videos to do an application. Ain't nowhere else in the, in uh, you know, it, it don't come that way, but it shows you the institutional barriers that they're trying to keep us out. And, and we have to figure out how we can battle against that and support those who are already in these spaces to be able to get beyond uh, those barriers. Can I tackle that for just a minute? Um, so I, I think one thing we haven't talked about, the common thing or the most obvious, of course, is mentorship. And when I say mentorship in, in this context of us talking, um, it doesn't matter what your mentor looks like. I mean, I am a 100% believer in that, you know. I know that it's popular to say, find somebody, you know, that looks like you, um, you know, to help and and mentor you. And there there is some validity to that. But um, I had many mentors uh, who who helped me that didn't uh, look like me. And so when I, I'm talking about mentorship, I'm, I'm talking about maybe we can facilitate um, mentors and hooking up uh, young people that are interested in careers who will guide them, you know, through this process, answer questions, um, help them uh, break down some of these barriers, help them navigate uh, the system. I can't tell you how important that is. There were instances when I had the opportunity, when I was deputy director of the National Park Service to help um, other young people just navigate the system and get positions that they would not otherwise either have known about um, and we kind of created an informal network. People would recommend people who would recommend people who would guide people to other people. It was kind of like the Underground Railroad. We would just guide people. Um, we would just guide people along. And I think that's, a, that's one element. And there are probably other uh, things that could be done as well. But finding you know, someone or a number of people that can help others connect and guide them through uh, the process is really important as well. You know, you work with and have worked with a lot of young folks uh, in, in your work, uh, just with the, in the core movement. What do you want Black and African American young folks to take away from, from your leadership and your experiences? So oh, this is Tina, I'll begin first. Um, I would like uh, African Americans um, Black people to take this, these particular words of interest. Become defined by a vision of the future rather than remain a bris- prisoner of the memories of your past. The reason I say that is what's been discussed is we've all been affected by uh, racism, discrimination in the past. Is where do we want to go from here in enhancing where we are? And that you either walk inside your story and own it, or you stand outside your story and hustle for your worthiness. Each one of you on this call, on this call, have something worthy to give and provide. And yes, there will be barriers thrown at you. Um, I constantly tell people, please put me in a box so I can ask, actually ask you why'd you put me in that box? <laughs> because just because I'm African American female from Philadelphia, people thought, oh, I would not want to go out west. Oh no, I actually flew out west, and I really took a long time on the flight. And I informed my mom I was going to be out there one year before I left, and I stayed five years. So it's Helping where people are, where they are the ones that put the barriers in front of you. Everything that we're talking about, people are putting those barriers. Break them down. And if you can't break them down, find that tunnel to get underneath. And if you can't find that tunnel, go around it. Because if someone's barrier does not mean that's your unsuccess. Your success is how you deal with the barriers. 
Last thing I'll say is there are five P's to success. These are five P's. Personality. Are- as you see, I bring passion to everything I do. Potential. Each one of you has a potential for success, and my job is to help you flourish in it. Productivity. Productivity is not always you produce something. Communication is productivity. Politics, understand it. Does not mean you're a politician, but you better understand it because everything we do in life has a political swing. And be persistent. People will throw stuff in front of you, barriers, potholes, everything. Be persistent in what you want because if you're willing to see it, you're willing to achieve it. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Cameron, over to you for uh, a brief moment. There are four themes that guide CAM's work, one being environmental justice. Please tell us a little why advocating for safe and equitable access to green and leisure spaces, mitigating climate change, and more is important to you and the work that you're doing out there. Yeah, so I wanted to think about how to leverage CAM's unique position. We were a respected arts institution, a trusted community partner, and a government agency. So for me, that was a whole world of connecting people to ideas, examples, and resources that could inspire them to be advocates in their own communities. Um, So our four guiding themes represent a way that a museum like ours can explore the intersections of Black life and and what I believe, and, and many of you share, are some of the most pressing issues of our time. So environmental justice was critical because as we've talked about today, too often the lived experiences of people of color are removed from mainstream conversations about the environment and environmental policy, while our communities bear the brunt of the negative effects of environmental pollution, the climate refugee crisis, or impacts of limited green space on our public health. Um, So it was really important for me that as a museum working under the Natural Resources Agency, that we be clear that environmental justice is a Black issue and that we stand in solidarity with the Black advocates and their communities who are doing this work historically and into the future. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Uh, Derek. uh, And folks, if you have questions, make sure you put those in the chat. We are running out of time. I knew this I knew this would happen. It was too quick. Uh, Derek, uh, tell us about the 126 urban gardens uh, and what inspired that effort. You know, the, the, the inspiration behind that is wanting to see a change in the built environment. Um, most times in, in uh, some of these communities, you, you, they're identified as uh, 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 food deserts, right? But we, we actually like to identify more like a food swamp. Uh, because it doesn't mean that there's no food at all, but it's just the, the food that's available to us, not necessarily uh, conducive to our healthy lifestyles, right? And so the question becomes, how do we actually transform our built environments in a way that is going to be uh, helpful to people actually living whole, free, thriving, healthy lives, right? And so um, the idea behind 100 Seeds of Change, which was the initiative that built those gardens, was to do just that. How can we work together with community members in their backyards, in schools, working in partnership with the city and our parks um, and people's patios? How do we make sure that uh, we can create more access to this, uh, to the abundance of healthy food, but also to the ideas that come behind it? How are we building programming? How are we having these conversations? You want to talk about uh, how a community can change? You 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 put people around a table with, with a plate of food. Uh, you'd be you'd be surprised about the types of conversations that can happen at that plate, yeah, you know I mean? or, or in that in that setting, right? And so uh, that's what we were able to do. And in that time frame, we we actually created that change in our communities, and it's Beautiful. a different type of conversation about the built environment in the landscape. So so it's been an amazing journey thus far. It turned into those fifteen thousand families being taught in nutrition, education, physical activity. It turned into over two million pounds of produce being delivered to people's homes uh, by way of our food rescue programming that we're doing now. Like I can go on and on and on about how just the spark of, of, of the seed in the ground turned into something that's actually flourishing in our community. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. All right, folks, we only have moments left. I want to address some of the questions that have popped up, bubbled up over in the Q&A section. This first one is from Melissa Ibarra. Thank you all for your time. Do you have any advice for working adults that would like to get into environmental work, free training, coursework, general resources, for example? It is wonderful that there are many opportunities for young adults, but many are limited to young adults. What about for older adults? Or working adults? 
So, uh, yeah, I'll tackle this one. Um, they're limited, but it's not necessarily an age. It's school. So uh, I think uh, Derek talked a little bit, that maybe Don, is that there are a number of programs, everyone, that's available where you are. Now, I will say that means where you are, you may have to go to another to a school outside your area. Uh, but there's those for those who are going to college. And there's, whether you get an associate degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD, postdoc, it's schooling. That's not an age. Many are young. Uh, now, regarding those that are uh, that are not are not going to school, that is the, that's the difficult part is what programs are available, and it's a hit or miss. Uh, I will say I'm actually typing an email right now. Yes, uh, multitasking, uh, which is there are programs from an educational standpoint that are available to people where they are. Whether it is fire training programs, uh, California of course has the biggest and best. I will say that because you guys constantly fires. We want to get a fire. I will say it doesn't mean you have to be on the fire line. It's being a contract, an entrepreneur in that environment. So that is available, and we're trying to do more of those. Last, dealing with conservation education, which is what Derek is talking about, there's more and more of those programs to help people build urban gardens and urban agriculture and urban forestry. And it's not urban forestry getting a degree. We need trees in the urban area like we need food. And so USDA is trying to work more on that, which is developing programs where you then can become an entrepreneur of building an urban garden or an urban forest in your area. I will say that it's trickling out. Um, if you haven't heard of the acronym NIFA, it's the National Institutes of Food and Agriculture. That All that agency does in USDA gives billions of dollars to entities. Doesn't have to be a school. It's also nonprofit or for-profit organizations. I will say though, I'm talking about it and the grant opportunity closed in December, but it's coming back around again. Maybe I can can help in a in a really uh, simple way of of approaching this. Uh, is that okay, um, Jared? Go for it. Um, you can also volunteer at state national parks, at museums, um, and do uh, volunteer work in the natural resource and cultural resource space, especially if you want to do interpretive work, uh, lead hikes and walks and tours. Uh, and give tours in museums. The reason I bring that up in the, the context of your question is many of these volunteer programs have excellent training programs associated with them. So you're gonna get the best education you could possibly get through some of these volunteer training programs. I was fortunate enough to work in both the museum space for a very long time, as well as um, in national and state parks and also as, as director um, of city parks in Sacramento uh, for a short period of time. And these volunteer programs uh, at every level all had training associated with them uh, that's free and where you get some of the best education that you're ever going to um, get. And I know at Exposition Park, Tina can probably speak to this, at just about every museum and Exposition Park, there are opportunities and, and training programs uh, that, that you can participate in. And I will thank you for that, Don, is what you need to do is basically contact your local national forest, national park, there's wildlife refuges in Southern California. <laughs> I realize of where it is, is you can Google it. And uh, he is right. We will always accept, well, I won't say we will, but we should always accept volunteers because one, it's your interest in that land. Um, and that's great training opportunity, great uh, point, Don. Mm -hmm. How fast an hour flies. It is 1.30 and that went too, too quick. We could have had multiple hours of this. This is really starting to get good and heat up. Uh, so I wanna thank all of our panelists for joining us in this conversation on Black environmental stewardship as we close out. Still got one more day of Black History Month. Keep the stories going. Thank you for all that you are doing out there in your respective fields. I know people out there, uh, the audience is really interested in staying connected with you. So I want to make sure that we share out your information so they can follow and track everything that you're doing from Don's podcast to the great exhibits that are coming up through Cameron's work, through what's happening uh, with Derek's work. So uh, we will continue the conversation. Uh, Secretary, that was, that was quick. We'll turn it over to you to close it. It was incredible. Well, Tina had four Ps and I have three I's. Inspirational, incredible legends and leaders in this discussion. And I was enthralled and seeing from the Q&A, everybody else was. Two is insightful. Um, progress made, but so much more work ahead. And the three, third eye is institutional. 
our problems remain institutionalized. And, you know, I'll be honest, I represent an institution that we learned from Don today had to be court ordered to uh, recruit diverse candidates. And we're still not there. We don't have a workforce that reflects this incredible dynamic diversity of California. Um, we, but we're focused on, on continuing to grow and learn. And so that's what Black History Month for us is all about. And that's what this panel was all about for me. So huge thanks, uh, panelists and leaders for joining us here today. Uh, remarkable conversation. Thank you so much, everyone. And just a final note, the recording of this conversation will be available on the CNRA website under the Secretary Speaker Series page uh, for future use and for you to share out. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day and uh, take care. Until next time, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bill.